Hello, my good people. We are back again today. We are going into the 1960s a little bit, more specifically just the JFK um, years, um, the Kennedy administration. And so to really do that, it's important to understand where we're coming from. It's not just this random blip in history. There are things that came before it that led into why maybe Kennedy was more successful or why these stances that he takes are more attractive to the American public or why um, these things lead up to the way that they do. But um, we're gonna start with just a little bit quick review of the 1950s. So we're thinking about social values um, of the 1950s. We can talk about gender roles, right? There are different roles for men and for women. Women still very much um, pushing into um, the home. Meanwhile, men, um, are more the breadwinners, and that's how it's represented in media for sure. But we know that there is some discontent and some change, um, the experience of change that a lot of women felt in World War II, um, especially people of color. There's a there's a civil rights movement really starting to brew that we didn't really talk about. We're gonna save that for its own special video um, because there is so much good content there to really understand that change over time and where all these things interweave. Um, but at the same time, there are other things besides societal values of like consumerism, um, this, this value on sort of like keeping up with the Joneses and trying to one up other people, but also conformity. Conformity is really, really big. Now, there are some people that are moving against that grain. There is beats movement, um, but for the larger whole, the societal emphasis is on conformity. Um, it's on consumerism and then strict gender values. Um, but we do have a lot of major foreign affairs things that happen at the end, too. For example, we have the Eisenhower Doctrine, um, where the United States is now sort of becoming that police force, not just on the Western Hemisphere, like we have been, say, for the past 150 or so years, beyond that now. Um, then we are now extending ourselves into the Middle East to try to prevent communism from expanding. There will be debates on that. Is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? This trend is really going to rear its ugly head. Um, later in history, we're going to have some issues in the 70s in the Middle East a lot. We're going to have some um, later on in the end of the 80s, um, early 90s, and then obviously in 2001 and beyond. So that is a long lasting change we can look at. Um, but the other thing we saw is we saw a new frontier really starting to uh, come up with the launch of Sputnik 1, which was the Soviet satellite. It was the first satellite um, successfully launched into space, and the Soviets beat us to space. Um, and as that kind of satellite goes up, Americans start to fear that, oh no, we're falling behind, we're losing the Cold War. It's this big spur um, for change and people really want change. They want heightened education, science, math, to try to out the Soviet Union and catch up in this race. And we really feel like we are, 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 are kind of losing this war at this point. And lastly, Eisenhower's views of the future, very, very fearful of where the country might be heading, this military industrial complex, this fear that um, our government, our economy is being too deeply intertwined within um, the defense spending industry and that we could easily derail our economy once again, number one, and, and derail the focus of our country, that we need to be wary of concentrating so much emphasis or power into this one um, of our, our bureaucracy and our economy. So. We will be looking forward about how these issues sort of play into what's going on in the 1960s. Before we really get to the bigger picture, we're going to look at our general objective of the day, as we always do, to make sure we hit the major points. Again, societal change is still coming. The 60s are going to be very different. There's a counterculture movement definitely brewing. Um, but also the biggest thing that you really can focus on here is continuity and change in the Cold War. So it's... A will be a result of, of B at times, or sometimes vice versa. But in this case, we're going to be talking about the policies. We can compare and contrast them to Eisenhower and to Truman and see where have we changed over the past 15 years since World War II has ended. And where is that taking us? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Pause the effects of that. We can also talk about our different responses over time. Um, how are we going to deal with these these other issues around the world? Are they going to be different based on location? Are they going to be different based on time? What other factors um, could impact these decisions? We can also talk about how 
the public is looking at these decisions. So not just what are they and why are they being made, but how is the public responding to that? Because there are people that um, will support these movements, whether it's domestic or foreign. And then there's also gonna be a rising tide of people that are against that movement. Um, and really all of this entire story is hitting at objective Q right here of, of the extent to which how America's identity really changes during this time period. So if you're looking at it um, chronologically, we are close to really being smack dab right in the middle. Um, so there's been a lot of change over time and we'll keep adding to the story the more we go into these subjects. Today is all about JFK. Um, JFK is probably one of the, if not the most um, famous American presidents of the 1900s. Um, and we'll talk about Kennedy and, and what his plans are domestically and foreign policy wise. Um, and we can compare and contrast them to the 1950s, right, under Eisenhower or even Truman a little bit into the 40s. Um, and we can really look at these changes over time, especially you should be able to understand this change from the past presidency because that's a little bit easier to connect, right, a line. Is it a continuation of? Is it a break from? Where, where are we moving on this story? And so that's a really good subject for us to hit at. Um, to show continuity and change over time, or to give us context if we were have to write about this on the actual AP exam. So Kennedy's administration can kind of be summed up by the new frontier, and the new frontier is his um, sort of domestic plan and, and, and foreign policy plan to an extent all wrapped up into one, his vision for the country. There is also perhaps a literal frontier of, of a place that we're going, kind of like the, the old frontier right back in the 1800s of westward expansion, but now there's a new one. Um, but also we have um, this kind of symbolic representation of where he sees America going for the future. Um, Kennedy has a big allure to him, um, very kind of classic Americana, and he's, he's got a very um, unique remembrance and he's got these kind of one uh, kind of one liners that are really, uh, that really have stood the test of time like this one. Ask, not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. There is these calls to action and this change around Kennedy. At the time that he is elected, he is the youngest president ever elected until Barack Obama is elected in 2008. So he has a lot of youth and energy around him and there's a lot of hope for what change that he can bring to the political So when we're talking about JFK, the first place we really have to start his election. Um, the election of 1960 is one of the highest voter turnouts in the past hundred years. Um, JFK really um, kind of steps into the scene here um, as a sign of this new era of politics, but he's going to go up against a very well-known um, career politician at this point. And Kennedy does have a political reputation of himself, but um, Nixon has definitely been in the scene longer. Um, he is involved in the um, House of Un-American Activities uh, back in the late 40s. And then he was Eisenhower's VP for eight years and, and things went really well in the 1950s. So it would not be that surprising to expect Nixon to get that election. He was very, very well known. But brand new technology is influencing society and politics. So we talked about in the 1950s how television has become widespread. It's this new way of spreading information um, in, in homes and its way of accessing it. And what's interesting about this debate is they pulled many, many people um, that um, listened and tuned into the debate, but there was still a wide variety of people um, and means at which they do that. So there were some people that listened to it over the radio, and there were other people that watched this debate. It was the very first televised debate. Um, now, it's going to really change a lot of things in politics where image and appearance are, are going to be really, really big, and it's not necessarily the right or the best thing to do, but it becomes part of what we see, um, and that becomes a huge swaying factor. When they interview people that um, listen to the debate on the radio, um, overwhelmingly, people felt that Nixon won this major debate. But when people watched on TV, um, Nixon seemed nervous, Nixon seemed sweaty, he seemed uh, awkward, un unwell, and Kennedy seemed cool, calm, and collective. And what was interesting about this is there's a little bit of like gamesmanship into it, where Kennedy had just come from being in California and 
dark skinned and, and, and tanned and, and went in. He was looking really good and, and healthy. Nixon was just getting over um, a, a sickness. And so he wasn't doing well to begin with. And so when they came in, they were about to put makeup on both the men. And Kennedy was like, no, I don't need it. I'm not going to do that. And Nixon didn't want to um, kind of give in to anything um, for Kennedy. So he said, you know what? No, I don't need it either. And with the the lighting and how well they felt and they looked, Nixon just looked like a wreck. But this wasn't the first time that TV really played a role in things. And we can think about a couple examples that we've talked about, right? Eisenhower did use TV commercials a little bit to campaign, but not massive debates like this. There was the McCarthy hearing that ultimately destroys McCarthyism against the army, um, where his reputation, as much that was left of it, got completely tattered. Um, there was a senator in Tennessee that used it to try to investigate um, a lot of organized crime and get information out there. And then Nixon actually used TV in the past as well. Um, when he was nominated um, to be the vice president, he gave um, a, a big speech because a lot of people questioned about um, improper campaign um, contributions that he was doing some illegal things um, and he gives this big speech it comes as the chapter speech because he, he was allegedly given all of these different gifts and he said I, I will give back kind of anything if there was anything that was illegal which it wasn't but if there was anything that was I will gladly give back everything except for one my dog checkers um, and and that was this alleged kind of campaign contribution of these random things that he received, but he, he's able to uh, fight off the um, kind of public perception. So Nixon isn't new to television. He's used it before, whether it was the Eisenhower campaign or himself defending himself. But all of these um, things have, have had an impact on politics, but this is the very first time it's more so directly into an election, a debate between these two candidates, which now is a very important thing. We have debates all the time in 2020. There's been so many for the Democratic Party to try to sift down who's actually going to be the nominee. Really, this, this is this huge pivotal event, but at the end of this election, Kennedy is going to win by a, a, a kind of underdog kind of slot. They really didn't think that Kennedy was going to win at the beginning, but he leads this, this big wave of change. Now, you'll notice when you look at this map, the map doesn't look like it's overwhelmingly dominated by Kennedy, and it's not. He wins 56% of the Electoral College, which is great, but there's it's kind of patchy. It's all over the place. So he does win parts of New England. He's from Massachusetts, um, doesn't win all of it. There's some sections of the South that he wins. He really doesn't win like anything out West except for Nevada. Um, it's choppy in the middle, so the country isn't fully in um, on this. And when you, you look at the popular vote, the popular vote is only separated by 0.1%. The other thing that you'll take a note when you look at this map is there are independents running in the South, more of the Dixiecrats as well, um, uh, that are actually winning electoral college votes. So it, it makes it very, very complicated electorally. So there's a lot of uh, questions and decisions here to be made. But overall, Kennedy still does win the majority that he needs. When we talk about Kennedy, it's kind of the same allure that came around Barack Obama in 2008, that because of his youth, um, it, it was very, very attractive, and people felt that this was a big break from what had happened in the past, and that this was a new era of change, and things were going to get done. There's a lot of unique things about Kennedy, another one being that um, Kennedy was actually Roman Catholic, which has never happened since or before where a, uh, a Roman Catholic has actually been elected president. Um, and, and just him and his young family were kind of uh, this, were, were in the eye of, of the American public, similar w ways to like the Obama family when, they were in, when uh, Obama was in office. So there's definitely a lot of change there. Um, and, and his big term that he uses and what his big promise is for the future of America is he promised America that there's going to be a new frontier for this country. Um, so we can compare and contrast a lot of these focuses to different um, large scale movements that different presidents try to enact, such as FDR's New Deal 
um, or, or kind of things that happen in the Eisenhower administration. There's not always a nice shiny word for it, but it is really nice when there is. And so for Kennedy, we call that the new frontier. His um, new frontier was a, a, a focus on two different areas. There's always a domestic and a foreign component to this. So these are the new areas which we are going to tread into that need to be conquered, that need to be fixed. In the domestic realm, there's educational reforms, healthcare reforms, even civil rights, um, which was a huge change that was happening. Brown versus the Board of Education happened in 1954. So schools had been segregated, but states were not complying, so that's going to be a huge question. Meanwhile, there's the foreign policy issue with the Cold War is still going on. Kennedy had this real hardline stance to defeating the Soviet Union, and, and what he claimed was, was he could win the Cold War. It wasn't that um, we were just going to exist with these people. He felt that Eisenhower had so many opportunities in the 1950s to actually end the Cold War and defeat the Soviets, and he didn't do it. And that's one thing that Kennedy says he's going to be really, really committed to doing, solving and ending this Cold War conflict. Now, um, we can talk about the domestic side first. It, it was kind of this pitch to going back to the FDR days. Um, Eisenhower was a Republican, and he didn't actively go against these changes, but he wanted to go more actively into the social reform um, age and so he tried to really call back to this this era of fdr and kind of connect himself in that realm but congress is still has a large amount of conservatives in it from the 1950s so they don't really have complete control of congress to really get this through um social reforms like education health care are going to be opposed and they're really going to kind of be shut down um so things we're talking about here we're talking about more money for public schools um, extension of Social Security, unemployment benefits, medical insurance for the elderly, right? All of these different things, which would be kind of like we have our Medicare and Medicaid systems, that these things were shot down um, by Congress, so they don't really go through. So Kennedy is not really successful on that front. Um, also, there were some attempts to change the welfare system for the impoverished in our country, and there was actually progress there. We see minimum wage increases, funding for public housing. So really understanding complexity that there were some things that Kennedy was able to change, but then there was also some things that he really kind of got stuck on. Um, he wasn't able to actually get through because if you don't have that full support of Congress, it's really, really hard once there's any sort of opposition. Um, and there was this major focus on, on trying to get our industry components as modern as possible. Um, questions on government spending and, and, and tax cuts, um, trying to stimulate the economy, make more jobs, get get everything keep going and building off of what happened in the 1950s. And that's gonna take a couple of years um, into his presidency before things really get to where they're going. But um, this is the thing that Kennedy's trying to build domestically. So he has these plans for healthcare and education. They, they don't really go through. There is some help and aid for the poor, and there is a focus on industry and, and the economic side of things, that um, economic boom continuing from the 50s. Now, um, when we're talking about those changes, they're a little bit hit and miss, they're a little bit choppy, but one thing we can clearly point to as a success for JFK was his role in strengthening the president. So there is this continued climb. There's a huge spike with FDR, and there's a little bit of a climb or a plateau with Eisenhower and Truman. Um, and then in the JFK era, and then what's going to follow, there will be an increase. Um, and the way that he does this is he takes more direct control. Um, Eisenhower had a lot of smart men around him, and he had a lot of these cabinet people on his staff that he left these decisions to, but JFK was more directly involved in these decision making. He was the one that was calling the shots um, more directly in a lot of these cases, so he is being more directly involved in these decisions. Um, the other thing that's important and, and one way that we could also argue that he strengthens um, the power of the government is he's going to shift kind of where these decisions are being made. So there's two parts um, to, I would say, sort of like the White House component. There is obviously the president, and he has two different 
groups that that he could sort of rely on or that help aid him on a on an overwhelming basis you have his cabinet so these are the people like the um secretary of the treasury right secretary of state right there's all these big decisions we can go all the way back to the washington administration and then education and health there's all these things that have have, have changed um throughout our, our country's history and added more positions to this cabinet but then there's also the direct staff of the president. And the difference is these cabinet positions are appointed, right? And they have to be approved by the Senate and they are the head um, overlooker of these general given areas. Kind of like when Hamilton, way back in the Washington administration was in charge of the economic policy of the United States. Then there is also something called the White House staff. The White House staff is kind of his, people, the president's people on a day-to-day -day basis. They are not necessarily in charge of these decisions, but they are the people that are with him every single day that are always sort of in his ear. And so he's going to take a lot of that decision-making power, and he's going to rely heavily more so on his staff than these cabinet-appointed positions. And so his staff and him are going to be kind of this um, deeply melded meeting of the minds where it's going to be the best in the that he's going to put around them and so he's going to always going to have kind of these these really smart people these top people in his ear this whole focus was like pragmatism so if you're pragmatic you're doing kind of what's best for you and, and you're kind of making these decisions these are these are kind of hard nosed they're very very well um learned people but these are not necessarily the people that are appointed by the cabinet so it's this kind of like are these just his inside men, the people whispering in his ear? Do they really know what they're doing? And he's going to put his top people that are around him every single day. Now, just to show you kind of the difference about what we're talking about here is under the Constitution, there's this setup. There's this three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. And under the executive branch, there are all these different departments that are created. And this is what makes up the cabinet along with the vice president. The White House staff, on the other hand, are, are people, like I said, that are there with him day to day. So these aren't officially cabinet appointed positions. These are people that he can kind of hire and fire at his, his own whim and, and people that he directly chooses that he doesn't really need approval of um, to actually have around him or have in sort of these sort of positions. So there's a huge change where it's almost a consolidation of presidential power. So the president isn't relying on all these different confirmations necessarily. There are people in these positions, they do have a role in getting information, but ultimately the, the, the shots are being called by, by the president, Kennedy, and, and his, his group of guys, his group of people around him. When we talk about Kennedy, um, we're not really going to talk that much about the domestic front. We kind of got that out of the way at the beginning because there is some tangible gain, but it's nothing colossal. The biggest thing that Kennedy is really known for and really takes in a whole different direction is the foreign policy. Kennedy is going to intensify the Cold War and, and heighten the Cold War tensions to its highest point probably possible in the entirety of this Cold War. And we are going to get to the brink of nuclear annihilation. We're going to see really how that goes. The other thing we can think about is kind of how his legacy is really formed and, and what things go well for him and what things don't. So to do that, continuity and change over time, I'm constantly going to bring this up, but understand where we've been and where we're going. So step one, we go back to the first present during the Cold War. Our original basis of fighting communism is based around the, the, the policy of containment. Keep it where it is. Keep that sand in the sandbox. We don't want it to get out. It's not about destroying these countries and fighting against them. It'll eventually turn into that a little bit more, but it's all about containing it where it is. We have a problem with that, though, when China falls to communism, Mao takes over, containment fails. And there's this scramble to fight back and push back. And we see the war in Korea and NSC 68 and the push to, to fight against this fanatical fear of communism. Um, and so we're trying to fight back on that. Then the Truman administration will end. Um, the Eisenhower, Eisenhower administration will come into play. And it's really based off this idea of, of the domino theory that if one country falls, then the rest will fall. So we need to catch them and prevent this chain reaction from happening. So China happened, but we prevented it from falling in Korea. We didn't completely liberate them of communism in our mind. But what we did is we stopped that expansion. So the containment held. 
but where else is this going to go? How are we going to prevent these expansions from happening in the future? And Eisenhower uses two things. One, um, massive retaliation, and two, brinkmanship. So it's this big threat about if you step at us wrong, we are going to threaten you with the full might of war. We are going to bring out the nukes. We will do whatever is needed in order to get this done. We have no problem with, with kind of threatening big threats. So we will threaten China with nuclear warfare if they don't stop their expansion, um, if they don't stop supporting the North Koreans, and it works. Um, we do it against the Soviets over in um, Egypt in the Suez crisis and get them out and get the French and English out and we have complete control and that works. But the problem is if they call our bluff, right, what are we gonna do? We either pull that trigger, war goes off and, and we're, we're playing with some really high stakes games here or right, ultimately it, it's, it's going to be this fear of, of what could happen next. And we're really banking on this concept that if you try to do anything, we will destroy you and we're willing to do that. Um, we're willing to sacrifice you and, and, and some of us in order to accomplish these goals. If you go after us, we will go after you. You have guns pointed at us, we have guns pointed at you. You try to bomb us, we have nukes for you. It's this kind of back and forth decision. Now, what's going to happen is with all of this interconnectivity, we have to see where Kennedy is going to go. Is he going to keep this Eisenhower mindset? Is he going to peel it back a little bit? Is he going to ramp it up? Where are we going with, with the Kennedy administration? How are they going to handle communism? So Kennedy's foreign policy is really wrapped up in, in fighting against communism, containing it. And that is the number one priority, bar none. Um, and I think you can really sum up his thoughts when you read his, his inaugural address. And this is just one quote from it. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and success of liberty. We will do this and more. That, that we are going to go to any length to ensure that democracy and freedom lives on. And so JFK really is going to push hard during the Cold War. It is going to be high stakes. He is going to be heavily aggressive involved in instance. Now, the problem is they don't back down, and this is going to keep happening higher and higher. The other big thing to really form Kennedy's mindset is that he wants to do all this, but he also believes that the Soviet Union could have been squashed already, that we could have ended this Cold War. Um, and that I kind of compromise on them, that we could have won this Cold War. Um, and, and, and the other big reason that we're going to see JFK really escalate things is he believes that there is a huge missile gap. Now, the missile gap refers to the amount of, say, missiles and weaponry we have versus the Soviet Union. From the information from his advisors that he is being fed, JFK is told that there is a missile gap. After Sputnik, remember, Americans are fearful that the Soviet Union has overtaken this Cold War race, this space race, this nuclear arms race, that they are way ahead of us, that we are really slipping and falling behind, that we need to do more and more and more to really catch up and take this lead again, that they have more missiles that we do. So we frantically need to catch up. We need to keep building. And so JFK, despite the warnings from Eisenhower about the military industrial complex is going to heighten the money um, spent on U.S. defenses, heighten the amount of money um, funneled into our defense expenditures, and really go in to try to close this missile gap. And it's going to take us into a couple different issues in JFK's short time in office. JFK um, is going to take us to Berlin, to Vietnam, to Cuba. And there's all of these events that are really going to start to heighten this discussion more and more and more. So we've used terms for each of the presidents so far in the Cold War. Under Truman, we have that major term containment. It's kind of where it all roots from, and, and there will be some changes in that policy after NSC 68. But containment really kind of sums up the Truman philosophy. Um, meanwhile, we get to Ike, um, and we have, you can either use this term mutually assured destruction or you can use the term um, massive retaliation, right? This idea that we're going to pay heavy price back and forth and we don't care. Or the general term brinkmanship. We're willing to go to the brink of war. We're playing these high stakes games. 
And that's kind of this big threat mentality and strong um, uh, reputation is really what's going to allow Eisenhower's policy to be extremely effective in the 1950s. JFK is going to take a shift and a break from that. Um, he's going to be more focused on, on what we would call flexible response. But that's the term we're going to sum up his Cold War policy, flexible response. Um, it, we need to have a army and armed forces that are able to respond to future problems various ways, all different types of fronts from every which direction. And so because of this fear of the missile gap that JFK is, is fearful that the Soviet Union has more missiles than we do, the United States really um, puts a lot of money into our armed forces, um, despite the fact that we are very, very far ahead. So future intel tells us that there was a huge gap between the US and the Soviet Union that was forming, but the United States was already ahead. This information was invalid, it was wrong. Um, we had 600 more bombers, B-52s. We had two Polaris subs, which are like nuclear submarines, and over 2,000 warheads. Um, it, it, was, it was very, very large, the amount of, of, of war and war knowledge that we had, but our information was wrong. And so we're still continuing to try to build in this fear that we're actually behind. They can take over us if they want. Um, really, where does this all root from? Sputnik. Do not forget about our little awkward friend here, Sputnik. Sputnik is this thing that it really catapults fear into the Americans that we don't have any tangible results yet. We're not in space successfully. Yes, we do have some men that do go to space, but they beat us there. So they must be ahead. They have this technology. What other things do they have that we don't know about? And because of this, America is going to really invest in ICBMs, these um, mid-range missiles, and and these nuclear submarines, and and just our nuclear arsenal altogether. Because JFK wants to have this this capability to be kind of on that first. Strike. We want to be able to hit them first, wherever, whenever we want. And so the building up of our military is going to continue at an alarming rate. When you look at the globe, one thing that people forget about is they always travel around. When you look at a map, because the maps that we see are flat, people go around the globe this way, right? Because um, that's where we're sailing or we're flying. But the problem is that geographically, we are not that far. We can just go right over the top of the world. We can point missiles at them. They can point missiles at us. And so we're a lot closer than most people realize, especially when we start setting up missile silos, perhaps in Alaska, this territory we bought from Russia back in the 1860s. So there is a lot of, of variables here. We also set up missile silos in uh, Western Central Europe, and then even in these areas sort of in the Middle East where we've sort of set up camp. They also have missiles pointing back at us. So it is sort of this little Mexican standoff that we have going on here. And what's going to go? What's going to happen? We don't really know. With all of this going on, um, we do have attempts at escalation, obviously, here. But there are some other ways of combating communism during this time period. We also tried, just like the Monroe Doctrine, tried to undermine communism by flooding some of these countries with money. We also go and to create things called the Peace Corps or Alliance for Progress. The Peace Corps is still around today, but our, our, our sort of missionary and help works that are, are sent to serve under impoverished countries. But by helping set up this, this system in these countries, we are gonna have a mass amount of influence. And again, it's sort of creating maybe allies for the future or setting up these protections, but it's not just the military means. So this is a little bit more complex for you that you could add other examples to support your DBQs, LAQs, and SAQs. But military strikes is really gonna be the major focus of the AFK. It's not gonna be more so the Peace Corps and the Alliance for Progress. We're gonna increase the size of our army, increase the size of our, our, our air force. Um, We're gonna add more covert operations, like the military role is gonna increase dramatically. And, and also we are gonna create special units such as the Green Berets um, that are added, more of these special forces units to send into these highly volatile areas in order to hopefully keep them from turning. It's this whole focus on combating communism is goal number one. It's goal number one, it's goal number one. 
Now, um, because of this missile gap, this is just another chart to show you um, how this gap really looks. There's a huge disarmament movement in the 70s and 80s. Um, and even though the Soviet Union really does increase this role, their entire country um, is, is collapsing. Um, and so there is this, this gap that really does form later. But for right now, um, where we are, the 1960s, this is us right here, there is a huge, huge gap between us and them. We have more missiles, we have better space technology, but the fear is that we are behind based on poor this space technology is really what's going to lead the rest of the space race. Um, and because the United States is so far ahead of the Soviets and we're, we're ahead on, on all these fronts, it's going to let us reach the moon before they do. Um, JFK is going to expand a lot of um, power and, and money and facilities into NASA, and the United States is going to get to the moon by 1970. Um, that is what his pledge is, at least. And that pledge does stay true. In 1969, America is the first person to land a man on the moon. Big question is, how are we going to treat the moon? Is it just going to be like another chunk of land? Is it going to be like another continent? Um, what can the moon be used for? So it seems really, really tangible that there could be some uses for it, even though that's not necessarily the truth. But one thing we can have for this is this big boost of confidence and, and kind of where the United States is going and, and really kind of sway that fear um, away from us and back in, into the Soviet Union. So we're really trying to avoid another Sputnik scenario where it spirals the United States in panic. And we really were panicked for over a decade about this issue, but this is a huge moment of progress and success for the United States. You may have seen movies or, or seen clips or, uh, or anything on the Apollo program where the first men walk on the moon, um, Neil Armstrong and, and, and Buzz Aldrin and and that America actually does land and, and bring back, and there's all these ridiculous conspiracy theories about um, landing that on the moon. But America does for sure get um, there first, and, and we're able to have that kind of progress around the world. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But I can't find it. Now, um, really back onto the Cold War on Earth. Um, JFK is going to have a lot of different confronta confrontations with the Soviet Union during his years of office. Remember, we are after um, the years of Stalin. Stalin dies in 1953. There's a little bit of instability um, in the 1950s. But um, the current leader of the Soviet Union, the second longest serving leader at this point, Nikita Khrushchev, um, is the man that we're going to be dealing with. And, and the situation that's set up in Berlin is going to be very similar to what we had heard during the Truman administration with the Berlin airlift. Now, if you remember that situation, what happened is Stalin was upset that there was a mass exodus from East Berlin to West Berlin um, because of the money funneling in there from the uh, um, Marshall Plan. But um, he sets up a blockade, there's no violence that breaks out, there's no nothing, it's just kind of closing the gates, not allowing people to immigrate in or out of uh, East Germany. And so what's going to happen is we are going to fly in, we're going to drop humanitarian aid and goods, and eventually that blockade will end. Nothing happens, no heating up in the Cold War, no violence, no, no change for that. The gates are just opened and, and things go back to as they were. But the big problem is that the Soviet Union, if they want to keep catching up or, or try to try to have a hold in this Cold War arms race. They need their technicians, they need um, their scientists, they need their engineers. And so many people are flooding into West Berlin or even sections of, of, of Western Germany, more so West Berlin because it's still in case, it's easier to get in and out, is that Americans, um, he fears, are enticing all of these good workers because of the heightened conditions that are in West Berlin. He's losing influence, he's losing Control. And so it really does sound like the Berlin airlift, but the solution that Khrushchev is going to provide is going to be very different. Um, they want to remove all U.S. influence, just like Stalin did, but instead of just shutting the gates in these regions, they actually build a physical wall separating West Berlin and East Berlin. The Berlin Wall is going to be built in 1961. Um, and this sort of di physical division is a physical manifestation of these Cold War separations of that Iron Curtain that 
metaphor is now a physical, tangible item. So now there's a separation. JFK is not starting off very well. He's not able to resolve this scenario. And there's literally a wall that is dividing West Berlin and East Berlin. So things aren't going too well for young Mr. Kennedy so far. So when you take a look at this map, you're going to see this giant fence all the way around. Um, and when you think about it, it's like, how can you box in another country? How can you say that you can do that? Well, they're all going to claim that this is on the East um, Berlin and East German side. So you remember, East Germany completely surrounds Western Berlin and Eastern Berlin. And so they're just putting borders around their side, but no one can get in, no one can get out. Um, it's really, really tough. Um, Eastern Germany and Eastern Berlin especially, extremely, extremely impoverished. A lot of these resources um, not really being replenished in these regions. So the standard of living is much higher, much better in West Berlin, but this entire city is completely divided. Families are completely divided and you can't get to the other side. Um, JFK is, is going to go in um, to Berlin, West Berlin, that is. Um, and he's going to be giving a, a speech in 1963 of this hope for unity and this call um, for unity and, and that claiming that the United States is, is with them. Ich bin ein Berliner. He's going to say in his really thick Massachusetts accents, right, that I am a Berliner. We are a, a, a Berliner, that we are together in this fight. But despite that, the wall still goes up. There's separation. It starts a little bit just with barbed wire fences, and then it is physically built around it with this giant concrete wall that divides, goes around the entire city. It's a massive, massive structure. Guards manning the other side, preventing people from getting in or out. If there are choke points or checkpoints to go in and out, you have to go through a wide variety of security detail, um, and, and it's not a good situation. JFK is starting off on a really, really bad foot. This happened in 1961 is when the wall begins to be built. So things are really not looking good for young Mr. Kennedy. Now let's go to Vietnam. So we have been involved in Vietnam since the end of Korea. If you remember that after we handled the, um, the war in Korea, the French really called us over to what they call Indochina, um, but Vietnam in Southeastern Asia and they needed help or wanted help for trying to stop a communist revolution brewing in their country or their colony that they're controlling as well. And there's a brand new revolutionary leader who's really getting a lot of popularity in the northern half of Vietnam by the name of Ho Chi Minh. Um, and this is really brewing throughout the 50s. America has not sent soldiers to Vietnam yet. We've sent some military advisors sort of helping the French, but the French have been fighting sort of a losing battle for now. Um, and America kind of has in the back of their mind that, oh my God, this is going to be like another China, what happened after World War II. We don't want that. We can't have that. We're not going to allow that to happen. So in 1961, as the Vietnamese um, from the North, the, uh, the communist Vietnamese leaders under Ho Chi Minh really start to gain a little foothold in the South, the United States begins to be a little bit more involved. Um, we start to not actually send massive amount of troops. That's not going to happen until close towards the, the middle end of the decade. But what we are going to do is we are going to start propping up different leaders. And we've done this in different countries already in the Middle East. We've done it in Iran more specifically. We are also going to do it in um, other countries in Latin America or even sections of South America. And we are going to prop up a different leader. DM. DM is democratic. Um, he's more sympathetic. We're able to give aid and try to put him in power. But the problem is this leader, um, DM, is not going to be able to control the populace in the South. And so the United States is going to go through a process that they do um, many different times throughout the 1900s, where we'll support a leader. When they become too unpopular, out of control, we'll, we'll push for this coup and maybe an assassination attempt. And there's a lot of conflict and instability, which really doesn't help the situation in the South. It keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And so as this thing gets more and more muddled, the message will be that these foreign invaders are trying to influence us. They're trying to take over and we need to rid themselves of us. We need to have this movement of the people. And all this is really going to do is have Ho Chi Minh gain more and more popularity. So Berlin, not successful. Vietnam, 
absolutely not successful. This guy that we put up within two years, we gave the okay, and America led our coup or a coup against the own person that we put up. So instability is running rampant. We will talk more about Vietnam under the Johnson administration, but there is a division that's starting to brew, and it's really starting to look a lot like Korea, so Americans think we can handle it in the same exact way, even though it is a decade and a half, two decades later. Um, really, when we're looking at this split, there is the North Vietnamese communist leader in Ho Chi Minh, South Vietnamese government led by Diem, it's not going to go very well, a lot of instability, and the North Vietnamese will have their central capital up in the north, but they're gaining a lot of communist support all throughout the southern part of Vietnam. We have a lot of forces that we're trying to fight, and what's going to make the Vietnam War so difficult is it's not just the North Vietnamese army known as the Viet Minh. There's also a group known as the Viet Cong in the south that are communists in South Vietnam that are kind of this guerrilla fighting force that have a really, really good um, linchpin and foothold going on in Vietnam. It's just gonna make this even more complicated as the years continue. Kennedy isn't really gonna gain much traction at all in this regard, and it's, it's not really gonna help um, when the fighting starts to take a whole different form that we're not really able to manage that well when the um, guerrilla fighting in the South makes it very difficult to determine who's a friend, who's an enemy, and who's neutral. Um, there are going to be a lot of civilian deaths, a lot of US soldier deaths as the story goes on. So Berlin, not successful. Vietnam, not successful. Let's check out Cuba. So Cuba um, has a brand new leader that, that pops up by the name of Fidel Castro. We really condemn the Castro regime. We are not supportive of Castro taking over this country, but he throws a coup, he takes over, he becomes appointed the dictator. Um, they start to develop a little bit closer to the Soviet Union, which makes Americans fear this even more, because understanding geography, where Cuba is, look at this map down below, look how close Cuba is to the coast of Florida. We've already been involved in Cuba before. America has had its hands in Cuba in the past. Think about the Spanish-American War, especially. We set up a permanent prison and sort of military base at Guantanamo Bay. So American forces, American influence is there. And in the creation of the Cuban um, constitution after the Spanish-American War, that the United States is going to have a lot of say in their government. Um, that America looks like this over, over empowering, over imposing big brother on the Cubans. We're not going to have a great reputation down there. Also, the other big issue is that because we didn't take a, a hardline stance in the 1950s, according to JFK, we're allowing this, as he says, a communist satellite to arise on our very doorstep. They allowed for a leader like this to happen. We should have taken a harder stance. We should have gotten involved sooner. Now, under the Eisenhower administration, there were some plans to overthrow Castro right away and not let him catch any um, kind of momentum, but those plans never actually matriculate. They never actually carry out until we actually get to the JFK administration. And, uh, the JFK administration is going to use um, something that Eisenhower and his people, um, directed by the CIA, came up with where they've been training Cuban exiles um, to invade and overthrow Castro, and they're going to invade in a region called the Bay of Pigs, which is on the southern end of the island. In 1961, JFK is going to give this okay, this thumbs up to go ahead and initiate this Bay of Pigs invasion. They are going to go into Cuba. They are going to um, overthrow the government. They are going to take out Castro. That is the plan. Problem. It fails, and it fails miserably. So we try so hard to get rid of Castro. It doesn't work politically. Um, two years later, as Kennedy is in power, Eisenhower is out. He picks up these plans. He actually decides to initiate it, takes a hardline stance that, that he believes is necessary, try to break up this relationship between Castro right here on the left, Khrushchev over there on the right. And as we invade the Bay of Pigs, this invasion is really going to require American air support, but, but JFK cancels this airstrike um, on Cuba. He doesn't want to get 
um, that far involved and doesn't think they need it. But the problem is without this air support, Castro squashes this whole invasion attempt um, easily. And because of that, all of these exiles are captured, um, tortured, they're, they're taken out. There's no hope for it. All this is going to do is fuel the fire for Castro. These Americans have now trying to take my life. They're coming at me, and we need to do something about it. That's the message Castro is going to give to his people. So it may not be so much that the Soviet Union and Cuba are close buddy-buddy friends, but they're both going after the same person. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Soviet Union and Castro are going to be buddied up real, real close, especially because Kennedy doesn't apologize for it. He doesn't make any sort of reparations for it, that Cuba and Castro are going to kind of nuzzle up and become closer allies with the Soviet Union and Khrushchev. Berlin is a failure. Vietnam is a failure. Cuba right now is a failure. As this cartoon, I think, very simply, appropriately really points out, this whole scenario really blows up in Kennedy's face. To make things even worse, about a year later, Americans have been spying. We've been using our, our, our Air Force, our covert operations over all of these different countries around the world, making sure that we're, we're keeping tabs on everybody as best we can. In 1962, towards the end, um, a spy plane that we have discovers that Cuban missile camps have been starting to go up. Um, there's 24 medium range missiles, um, 18 short range missiles, right? These are ICBMs. Now, short range and medium range, it doesn't really mean that much when Cuba is so close geographically to the United States, right off the coast of Florida. So the question is, what is the United States going to do? How are we going to handle this situation? Should we bring in airstrikes right away? Should we try to find some diplomatic way to trade nukes? Um, with Cuba, we have nukes in Turkey pointed at Moscow that they're aware of. Um, should we bring out a blockade, keep everything coming in and out of this country? Should we block off Cuba? Should we go for just a full scale invasion like we've done in the past? What is the United States going to do? Failure, failure, failure. What is this going to bring? Right? These are nuclear warheads. There are nuclear missiles off the coast of Florida pointed at the United States. Over 95% of our continental United States is in danger that could be hit. And we don't know what we're going to do. We don't know how we're going to handle it. Kenny's decision is not an invasion. It's not an airstrike. He chooses, and, and he uses this word very specifically, to quarantine Cuba. Right. So think about what a quarantine means. It's keeping people when they're sick or possibly contagious, keeping them alone or isolated. So let's isolate Cuba. Right. No new missiles. Right. Anything going there. No new missiles. Right. If the Soviet Union doesn't remove these nukes, then we'll invade. So we're setting up this kind of system of rules that we're going to keep it where it is to keep any new missiles right, from coming into Cuba, keep anything out of going in there. And at the same time, we are going to threaten the Soviet Union if they do not remove these, because they are the ones putting these in there. Cuba doesn't have that capability. Soviet Union is sending all of these things over there. They're building them up. They're building missile silos all over this island that we need to get them to take these out. How are we going to get them to back down? How are we going to get them to do it? We don't know. So with the Cuban Missile Crisis, there's really three people involved to understand what's going to happen here. There is the United States and Kennedy on one side. There is Khrushchev on another. And then in the middle, there's Castro. Um, Castro obviously is aligned right now with the Soviet Union, and so there's some there's problems there, and we're fearful of, of, of what they're trying to do. And there's a lot of really good resources you can use. There's a TED Ed video for you to get a good base of what's happening in the Cuban Missile Crisis. You can also um, you also should take a look at the Armageddon letter that really gives you that point of view of each one of the three major players um, in the Cuban Missile Crisis to tell you the whole story. So U-2 plane is flying over um, Cuba, gets shot down. But there's other U-2 planes that do go over. Um, and as we go over, we get pictures. And this is the actual picture 
uh, one of the pictures that that we that we see we see kind of um, coverings for missile launchers and silos, fuel tankers, right? Um, launch positions, everything ready to go. So we have an idea about what they're building and where they're building it, and we kind of put it all together. And we realize that they're building nuclear missiles. These are all over the island, um, and that's what kind of makes this even more troubling. It's not isolated to an area, it's the whole island all over the place. Some long range, some short range. The radius uh, of these, if you look at this map, um, covers almost all of the continental United States, all of our major cities for sure, including our capital, um, and there's nothing we would be able to do about it. It also reaches out into Central and South America as well. There's a lot of people at risk here. What are we going to do? How are we going to keep these bombs from going off, not only for our sake, but the rest of the world's sake? Because once they go off, there is nothing you can do to really stop that. So we have these missiles in Cuba. How is this going to be handled? We are going to set up quarantine lines. We're not going to use the word blockade because a blockade is technically an act of war, but in reality, that's what it is. They try to, um, we try to put up warships and we set up different lines. First, we have something called the Walnut Line and the Chestnut Line. Not really that important, but we set up these lines. What is going to happen is the Soviet troops um, are going to um, be taking their ships and they're going to be um, kind of sailing them closer and closer and closer to this line. Um, and, and eventually on this, this, this final line, this really important line, what's going to happen um, is there is going to be the ships are going to be coming forward, coming forward, and then they're going to teeter on this line and turn around and come back. Um, they are not actually going to cross that line, although for many days, almost two weeks, we fear that it's about to happen, especially as we see Soviet troops or, or, or Soviet ships, rather, approaching these lines. The whole idea here is that we are standing eye to eye, that we are ready to blow them up, they are ready to blow us up. What's going to happen? Americans don't know what's going to happen. If these bombs go off, America will cease to exist for the rest of eternity. It won't happen. Um, we'll be wiped off the face of the earth along with many other sections of the earth where we'll be firing our missiles back at them and it's going to lead to almost a nuclear holocaust. Um, we're eye to eye with each other. We have nuclear weapons pointed at each other. Um, and, and this whole um, kind of concept of, of literally on the brink of war, this is where we're at. We're at not just the brink of war, we're at the brink of, of humanity ceasing to exist. Um, and this kind of cartoon, I think, really sums it up. All right, Mr. President, we are willing to negotiate. Now that we're even, now that we both have nukes pointed at each other, and there are going to be some big decisions. We get very, very, very close from firing these missiles on both sides. And that would have been the end of, of a large portion of humanity as we know it. This crisis is going to get so close to, to nuclear annihilation of, of so many people. But... Ultimately, the Soviet Union is going to remove any missiles that it has in Cuba. They're going to be completely taken out and removed. The United States is going to never um, invade Cuba. We'll vow that we will never do that, um, even though it's kind of been on our eye for quite some time. So you can say our way back to the early 1800s. And the other big kicker is, is America is going to remove our nukes from Turkey that we have pointed at Moscow. So we're going to lower our guns, as will they. Right. So that's what happens. But the bigger thing to really understand is the wide reaching impact of this incident. First and foremost is a political victory for JFK. Most of his his uh, career has been a pretty much a flop. It hasn't been going well. But this is a not just a victory, a massive victory. We are at the brink of nuclear annihilation and we stepped our ships back from that cliff and we were able to reach peace. So that's a huge, huge thing. What's going to happen in 1963, JFK is going to be assassinated at the end of 1963. So this is going to be the last major thing that he really gets done. And so this is the thing the, that uh, so many people are going to hold on to and why JFK, I think, also has a really, really positive light and memory because he's really not that successful, except for this. A lot of his other things are kind of a flop and a failure. Um, anything that's passed for civil rights, he didn't actually do. They're done in memory of him, but he doesn't actually do anything. This is the one major victory that he has, but it's a huge, huge victory. 
Number two, a hotline is installed, and this is a real thing, the red phone between um, Moscow and, and Washington, D.C., a one-way communication immediately directly to the office of the, of, uh, of the leader of the Soviet Union to the president of the United States. We're trying to improve communication. And part of this biggest reason why is because we came so close to nuclear annihilation on both sides that it really caused people to step back. Um, I love this quote from JFK because I think it, it really sums up where it's so easy to vilify our enemies um, in this fact. But our most basic common link is the fact that we are all inhabitants of this planet. We all breathe the same air. We all cherish our children's future. We are all mortal. This idea that we came to this realization that, oh, oh my God, what did we just almost do? We stopped ourselves. Thank God. But what almost happened? And this fear of almost having a terrible terrible incident, terrible accident, really makes people take a step back, take a deep breath, and start to reevaluate things. From this point on, our relationship with the Soviet Union is going to be much more on the, on the lines of, of peace negotiations directly with them. Now, there's going to be incidents um, with communism around the world, like we're going to see in Vietnam under the Johnson administration, into the Nixon administration, but this is going to cause a huge, like, oh my gosh moment. The best way that I can think of describe this is a lot of people that are that if you're watching this video right now, you're probably able to drive now or you're learning to drive now. If you've ever been driving faster on the highway, maybe you shouldn't have been, but you have been and you almost get into an accident where somebody slams on their brakes and you come really, really close or you almost shift lanes and you almost bump into somebody else, hit somebody else. You almost have a terrible accident and you you kind of have that panic attack for a second. You take a breath and, and you're panicky for a while, but eventually you kind of calm down, at least for the time being, that we are able to make this decision. Oh my gosh, I need to be more careful. I almost made a really, really terrible mistake. I need to take a step back. I'm getting a second chance. So that's really what we're going to talk about for the Kennedy administration today. We will pick up on the Johnson administration and Vietnam in another video. But if you have any questions about what we talked about in this today, feel free to drop a comment in the section below and I'll get back to you soon.